Coming up on Tech Thing, the barbecue episode, ATSC 3.0 explained, because over-the-air TV keeps evolving. Shannon's beloved grill bot cleaner, my favorite digital thermometer, and the Trail Keg Gallon Growler reviewed. Plus, first aid advice, it's all coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons, you made this episode of Tech Thing possible, and hey, if you all get something useful out of this episode of Tech Thing, please consider contributing to the show at patreon.com slash tech thing. We're brought to you by viewers just like you. Thank you so much. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. Sometimes. Sometimes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're bringing it back. I, you know, somebody modified the script and jumped it back like three, the template for Oh, the how funny. Yeah, there's also purple script in there. Hmm. Purple hair, purple text. Interesting. Completely circumstantial evidence. I don't think we've ever used purple text. In any case, on an even more random note, I just want to read this title off my computer before we talk barbecue. Google launches updated DIY kits for AI voice and vision with educational focus available at Target. Really? So what is this? Target. <laughs> yeah, available at Target of all places. That's interesting. So they, last year they started doing these, these basically STEM-focused kits and, and ones that, you know, the voice kit, a do-it-yourself intelligent speaker. And then over here on the right is the vision kit, the do-it-yourself intelligent camera. Right. And um, it's something that Google Developers does. Last year, AIY Project launched to give makers the power to build artificial intelligence into their project with two do-it-yourself kits. And there's a really amazing website, AIY Project with Google.com. Okay. And uh, when you go to the kits, the AIY Voice Kit uh, 2 includes a Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, WH, and a pre-provisioned SD card. And the Voice Kit uh, 1.1 includes a Raspberry Pi Zero again, a Raspberry Pi Cam 2, and a pre-provisioned SD card to That's make the cool. whole thing as painful, no, as painless. <laughs> Sorry, painless as painless. possible. <laughs> the, uh, the Amazon Raspberry Pi DIY thing about killed me. Um, but uh, if you go to aiyprojects.withgoogle.com, you can actually sign up to be notified when these are available, uh, which hopefully sucks a lot less than Target's deal with Hunter. If you're a big Target fashion fan, you know about the whole debacle with Hunter. I don't. Oh my goodness. Although I don't do Target fashion, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that is why. Maybe that would be why. <laughs> Somebody I know blew up because like there's a British designer kind of company called Hunter and they did a special one-off you know, ah, project okay. with Target and like nothing was in stock and everyone was angry and they all, all right. hate Target or Target. <laughs> I'm just looking at this and like, hey, I, it's, it's like Raspberry Pi projects at Target. I mean, mm -hmm. who knew Target would replace Radio Shack? Yeah, that's totally random. I wonder if they have solder at Target now. <laughs> that would actually save me a lot of time if they did carry would, solder. I'd be okay with that. And they're open until midnight around here. I know. Even better. It's awesome. They have a Starbucks, and if they sold solder, I could just go shopping at Target every single day. The Starbucks Yay, closes way before Target Yeah, that's does. true. That's true. Well, we're not here to talk about shopping at Target. We're <laughs> here to talk about technology. Like? <laughs> the grill bot. Right. <laughs> yes, that's right. This thing is dirty, so I'm going to get my hands dirty, but it's basically a tiny robot that cleans the grates of your grill in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minute increments. And it comes with a handy little charging cable. It's a barrel connector, so you gotta have a barrel connector on there. And it has three brass brushes on the back, although they also sell stainless steel and nylon versions as well. You know there's a slim list of things to talk about with, with a project when Shannon points out that there's a barrel connector on the charger. There's, yeah. There's just not, so okay. It's so, gonna be short and sweet. <laughs> so you guys have a charcoal grill at home? Yes, we do. So I was, I was mocking you mercilessly when you said you wanted to review this because I'm like <laughs> you know it takes me about three minutes with my brush yeah exactly you know and maybe if I'm feeling fancy I wipe some more oil on there so we season the grill a little yeah. harder and that's a big point that I want to point out in this review is that if you if you just scrub your own grill all the time and you don't let stuff build up on there very often, or if you don't need to spend a lot of time to actually clean it by hand, you probably don't need to pay for this. And speaking of that, I should probably bring up the cost. So if you check it out over on Amazon.com, you can get this black one for $114.99. However, you can also get the red one or this other black version. Let's see. Oh, that one's red. Red for one fourteen ninety nine. That's interesting. Did the price It says color red, time? but it's a black icon. So orange is eighty nine ninety five, and then black is eighty nine ninety five. So is that international safety orange or pumpkin spice orange? I, I would say that's international safety. <laughs> that is VLC icon orange. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you charge this thing for eight hours the first time that you use it until you hear it beep. And when it beeps, you know that it's done. You make sure that your grill is totally cool and it's on a flat surface. So if it's on a hill or something, it's not going to work out so well. And then if it's too hot. You, you know my stick? Yes. I can use my stick with bristles even when it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if it is too hot, if it's over 250 degrees, the grill bot will sound an alarm and shut down because it's too hot for the, uh, the tech pieces inside of this to work properly. As you'll understand in a moment, it doesn't shut. I mean, moving might be better for it, but it shuts down right. so you don't hurt yourself when you're picking it up. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, you place the grill bot on the grill grate, and then you press a little button on the side of it either once, twice, or three times for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. So depending on how much grime and crap is Filth. all over your grates, your filthy you grates. might want to go for 30 minutes. That's what me and my husband did because he never cleans it. That's the reason why we got the grill bot. <laughs> so the grill bot will shut down and beep once it's done. And if you need to stop it during a cycle, all you have to do is hold down for 10 seconds on the button and then it will automatically turn off. Now, <laughs> if I turn it on and I'm gonna do this while I'm holding it, which I'm really scared about because these things have already poked me and drawn blood at least once. So you have an idea from the B-roll <laughs> that just went by that this yes. thing's a little intense. It's pretty intense. I will exit stage right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. So the button is on the front and it will light up in blue whenever you t press on it. I'm going to turn it over so it doesn't actually attack my face. Good. And I'll press it just once and I'll hold it steady. There it goes. All right, so that's what it does. And then it goes all over the place on your grill. And if I hold down for another 10 seconds or so, I'll let it stop. And then it turns off. And that's all you have to do. Okay, I'm going to set this down before it destroys any body parts, but uh, basically, yeah, you just turn it off whenever it's done or it just automatically starts beeping whenever the cycle is done. When you put it in your grill, you want to make sure that you have a lid. If you don't, it will just fall <laughs> off the side and it will run away or it will fall upside down and then just like well, lie in a very sad moment in the grass <laughs> next to your grill. Does, I mean, if you have a, a, a lid or lip all the way around your grill, it'll stay in then there? Then it'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because so it's, it's not bouncing around or anything. It stays on the grates, but it is going to run off of it if there's no lip on the sides of it. How do I clean the brushes? Yeah, good question. So the first time I took these off, you can simply put them in the dishwasher, which is wonderful, but you have to press a button on the side and then you pull out with them. The first time you take them off, they are very, very hard to take off, but after that, it's really easy to remove them. And then you press them right back on, and they click into place, and then they're perfectly good and ready to go. To clean the actual grill bot, you just use a microfiber cloth all over it because it will get a lot of grime and gross stuff all over it, like you can see in my hands now. And after you run a 30-minute cycle, which is the one that I tend to use, you still have about 75% of the battery still left, which means that you can still run it another three to four times before you have to recharge the battery That's for cool. another four to eight hours, depending yeah. on how long you actually need to charge it. So my thoughts on this, uh, it's incredibly loud when you put it in your grill, so don't clean your grill in the middle of the night or you will definitely tick off your neighbors. That sounds Ask like me the, how I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's MSRP is pricey, but at 90 bucks, it's a solid deal compared to the... This is sort of a saving the marital relationship around it grilling it purchase. Was, it was, your wife really likes it when you clean things, but you never clean the grill. So honey, here's your birthday present. <laughs> the brushes may screw scratch up on the inside of your grill, but they do sell nylon ones that can help with this if you prefer nylon. It's a grill, it's gonna get scratched up anyway, so we don't really care about that. Uh, it doesn't get to the bottom of the grips so, or the grates, so you have to flip them over and run it again, else you just do it by hand right. and that's not, a, not an issue. You still need to clean the corners by hand oh. if you're on a square grill, look like I think both yeah. of us have. So but keep you see, that my in brush mind, is kind it's of circular. square and I just, my brush. Yeah. Otherwise, I would say it's not really worth the price. If, <laughs> if you uh, clean your grill pretty often and you keep it somewhat clean after each and every time you cook, then you're probably fine without the grill bot. But if you leave it for like a year without cleaning, you would probably really enjoy the grill bot. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, so yeah, that was a really fun one. It did draw blood. This is the first review I've done in a long time that drew blood on my uh, on my fingers. So thanks, Grillbot. Really appreciate that. But I'm very glad that my husband actually uses it. You can draw blood with my stainless steel brush. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> Let us know what you think or if you have any other um, cleaning technology that I should get for my husband so that he cleans more often. I would really appreciate it. <laughs> Ask at techthing.com or tweet at snubs. 
As many of you know, I do not drink, but almost all of my friends and my spouse drink beer. And the very coolest ones get growlers wow. from the local brewery. This is not a growler from the local brewery. A growler is like a gallon, yeah. usually in a jug. Yes. Um, they're awesome. 42 ounces. I'm told. Try 128 ounces. Whoa, geez. <laughs> That's I a gallon. I stick with 42. <laughs> this, is, this is not necessarily the single serving size unless you're like me, in which case you lose your privileges. Wow. Um, in any case, so growlers are awesome uh, until they grow flat, which mm -hmm. takes about 24 hours if you leave the cap on or a few hours if somebody leaves the cap off. As a friend of mine said, bastards. <laughs> so check this out. The trail keg, gallon trail keg package. Wow. So this is... Uh, I don't know how to describe it, so I'll let them describe it. Cold for a day, perfectly carbonated for weeks. It's essentially converting uh, their gallon growler or some other gallon growlers into uh, 128 ounces, AKA a gallon, AKA eight pints. They got a 64 ounce version available too. Vacuum insulated, cold for 24 hours, hot for 12 hours, which actually worked in my testing. Maybe not like, you know, 34, 40 degrees cold, but well <laughs> under room temperature. That's good. Um, they've got a standard like corny uh, keg ball lock on the top. So you could use either the like tap that comes with it or a... Oh! Whoop. <laughs> That's why I was going to shoot this in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> it uses a, we'll talk about that in a second. So it uses a basic standard tap so you can uh, drop a gallon actually of your local craft brew inside of mm -hmm. this into a kegerator if you want to just transport it home and use the kegerator you've already have if you're That's a kegerator. Cool kind of gal or guy. Uh, and then there's this, which is the trail keg regulator. Um, so it's basically a CO2 regulator. It uses threaded CO2 cartridges. Oh. Um, I gotta say my one kind of frustration with this involved getting the um, threaded cartridges into the regulator oh, okay. because there's that moment in between like when the seal breaks and when you finish turning it down. So either I'm doing gotcha. it wrong or I would prefer, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So this is a gallon, right? It's 13.75 inches high, it's 6.37 inches wide. Transport it without the tap and the regulator attached. That's a good point. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds silly, right? But you don't want all of this stuff <laughs> hanging off the sides when you're moving it around. Yeah, let me <laughs> point that away from your <laughs> it computer. I'm nervous, um, I don't want it spilling on mine. <laughs> so you don't have to just use it for beer, although it's perfect for that. Uh, you know, I ran some craft soda and right so, now there is, yeah, there is fizzy water in it. Cool. Because I love fizzy water. Uh, also, uh, because uh, the children could not keep their hands, their little paws off the tap <laughs> when it was not. sitting in the kitchen. Um, not that that's foreshadowing or anything, <laughs> uh, given the family tradition. It works! Uh, as you noticed <laughs> earlier, <laughs> um, the tap, like while it was sitting around, even completely off, the tap tended to drip a mm -hmm. little bit, which is really irritating. Um, I also wish it used non-threaded CO2 cartridges because those are so much easier to find around here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I love about this is the container itself is actually useful as an insulated gallon container, even if you don't need the tap, and That's it did better nice. at keeping things cold than I expected it would. It is not inexpensive, but then again, neither is craft beer. It's 200 bucks for the 64 ounce version, or no, 200 bucks for the gallon version. Okay. So for the complete rig, it's 200 bucks. Uh, 64 ounce version is $155.99. Definitely what? not inexpensive. True, but if you look at some of the dedicated sort of beer, pressurized beer growlers on Amazon, this starts looking really useful because not only does it do that, um, the whole, you know, like regulator CO2 pressurization beer thing, um, you can also use it for things other than beer. And most of the dedicated growlers are like for beer and they're That's thin walls, cool. so you better fit them in your fridge. I would definitely just use it for beer. Well, <laughs> a woman has to have goals in life, and I respect <laughs> that goal. Seriously, I mean, it's it's kind of like, I mean, I use everything for everything because it's kind of the way I roll. Yeah. Um, if you already have a big growler at home, check the list at trailkeg.com. They have compatible growlers. Uh, they sell their lid and the regulator separately if you have a compatible growler, which is really, really cool. That's nice. Yeah, actually. Uh, I thought that was pretty sweet. Um, and they also do an external threaded or an external lid if you want to do their portable system on different uh, keg designs. Ah, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy. The trail keg lid package turns your Hydro Flask Lifeline Reduce uh, barrel style growler into a pressurized growler. It goes on and on. There are always more ways to enjoy beer. So I think this is cool because I just started getting into craft beers and I would love to maybe potentially borrow this. You can make arrangements for that. Okay, cool. We you can empty it of the fizzy water, though, because I'm not a big fan of fizzy water. Wow. Just beer. Just beer. <laughs> it's a very 18th century attitude towards <laughs> hydration. In any case, like 36 hours and still fizzy. That's awesome. Um, I, yeah, what she said. Go for it. I'm forth. a fan.
and enjoy your brew. The website is trailkeg.com. And yeah, occasionally we like gadgets. <laughs> I love my digital thermometer. How much do you love it? So much. <laughs> like Z-O-M-G much. Um, I know there are amazing folks out there that can time stakes with a clock or with their eyeballs, but I'm not, not one of them. Um, there's also the whole like fleshy part of the thumb pokey test. Yeah, that I just never do it right. It's like rare. And I went to school for this stuff. You know, um, I worked in kitchens. Like the whole thumb to middle finger for rare doesn't work because maybe I spend too much time shoveling in my wife's garden. <laughs> um, if I do this and poke the meat, then that sounds so rude. Um, then I end up with an overdone steak. So a <laughs> thermometer is about getting your temperatures right. Medium rare is 130 to 135 degrees. I air to 130 and pulling it before it overcooks. Uh, medium is up to 145 degrees for steaks. Um, it also ensures safe cooking habits, mm -hmm. especially if you're getting crazy with your wild pork and your chicken and stuff. Very Not that true. there's wild chicken. That would be really <laughs> funny. Chickens are scary. There are by totally the way. wild chickens in Hawaii. Yes. Well, those are. <laughs> <laughs> there's wild, and then there's domesticated animals running free. <laughs> If you've ever been to Key West, think about the roosters. Um, digital thermometers are so much better than analog thermometers. If you still have an analog thermometer in your kitchen, it's time. Um, first of all, they are easy to read, big numbers. Mm -hmm. They are fast. So if you're checking frying oil for 400 degrees, it's nice. Or a hot, you know, like meat on a hot grill. It's right. like two, two and a half, three seconds to read this. Frankly, I found my grilling got a lot more precise when I started using a pen rather than my masculine intuition, or again, the poke yourself, poke your steak method, which I just hate. <laughs> Um, the state-of-the-art digital thermometer is the Thermoworks Thermapen Mark IV. If you go to like barbecue competitions or kitchens, you'll probably see one of these. This is the ultimate. It is the fastest. It is the most accurate. It is the standard. Like I said, at barbecue conventions, this is the this is the pen that most people want to be when they grow up, and you can pretty much only get it at thermoworks.com. It is a hundred bucks. Oh wow! Yeah, it is flawless. <laughs> um, literally, uh, barely two seconds for a temperature read, uh, and there's a four-way display on that. So you know, no matter which way you're holding the thermometer, mm -hmm. you can actually read the display vertically. That's good. Um, again, it's a ninety-nine dollar thermometer, which is how I ended up with this. This, the Lava Tools PT12 Javelin. Hey, that's a lot cheaper. Yes, it's 25 bucks off Amazon.com. The Instant Read Meat Thermometer. Uh, that color is Chipotle. Chipotle. Um, <laughs> it's a couple seconds slower than the Thermapen, which is like four seconds, but I'm not that precise a cook that two seconds is going to make a huge difference. Okay. Um, because I love the wire cutter, of course, I went over to the wire cutter. The Sweet Home has now been folded into the wire cutter. And they have, uh, they did their usual insane amount of testing, and they had one that I had never seen before. Thermoworks now has a lower priced option, the Thermapen. Ooh. Which, oh, it's so cute, and they have a purple one. They Sold. have, yeah, well, it's also, Sold. look at the, if you, you know, if we, if we close in on this, you'll see how the numbers yeah. rotate. So oh, you can actually, it's neat. easier to, as somebody who has literally sort of been like reading upside down and backwards yeah. uh, outside at night, um, it's pretty cool. So again, much like the That's Thermapen, yeah, upside, <laughs> reading a thermometer upside down at night while holding yeah. your <laughs> flashlight on it is a pain in the ass. Um, but this is the Thermopop. Again, it's available at thermoworks.com. It's 29 bucks. Um, it's probably a teensy bit faster than the Javelin, but seriously, it's that rotating display that caught my eye. Yeah. Um, it also has a much longer probe if you're into cooking massive roasts and hams and turkeys and you want to make sure you get all the way to the center for your temperature reading. Uh, which I think is not a bad thing to do at all. <laughs> Absolutely. I use this all over the kitchen, and I got particularly nerdly with it for a while and wished I'd had a longer probe on this when I was going through my 203 or 204 degrees for my <laughs> boiling, not, well, my pre-boiling water for my coffee. Um, I feel like I should get one of these for my husband, too. You should get one of these I'm for getting all of these, like, birthday <laughs> ideas, and his birthday's coming up pretty soon, so maybe I'll just go nuts on, like, a, a kegerator and a... a Temperature thermometer. This is cool. Party at Shannon's house. Party at Shannon's house. <laughs> <laughs> we love your questions, your tips, and your suggestions of products and ideas to check out. Ask at techthing.com is the place to send them, or you can tweet at techthing, at snubs, or at Patrick Norton. And a big shout out to our patrons at patreon.com slash techthing. You pay the bills, you make the show possible, and quite frankly, you keep my family fed. Thank you, patrons. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing happen at patreon.com slash techthing. And thank you so much for supporting Tech Thing, no matter how you do it. How old's your cooler? Don't ask. I don't even know. <laughs> so 10 my, years old? 
Yeah, my, my, okay, so my old cooler was a hot mess, literally. Um, <laughs> I had two 100-quart coolers, got them back, my pre-children running in the Baja, Mexico, 1,000 days. <laughs> They've been hammered on. They've gone from uh, from like San Francisco to the East Bay to La Paz to Mexico to Denver, Salt Lake City, Goose Lake, uh, Oregon, Portland, Oregon. I leak literally probably ten or fifteen thousand miles on these coolers. Wow! Um, including one of them being packed with tools while bouncing on trails uh, down in Baja. And, and on our last camping trip, I realized that we'd put all of the ice in that cooler because. Uh, we were losing half of a 25 pound bag of ice a day. Gee. Well, if they just weren't insulated. They were uh. never particularly great coolers for insulation and they've just, you know, after being abused for more than a decade, I like to think of them as being shells and all the insulation had collapsed into the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> They've suffered for their sins. But seriously, <laughs> there is something incredibly wrong about heading to town to buy ice halfway through a t- three-day weekend. It yeah. wasn't like it was 105 degrees in Mojave. We were up on the coast, and it was like 60 degrees in Northern California. Yeah, there's no reason why that should be happening. No. So as I searched around, I heard a lot of folks talking about like the $400 Yeti or Yeti competing type cool guy coolers that are industrial. I, I mean, they're basically... That's a they're, lot of money. They're all, and, but they're, they're pretty much like forever coolers, oh, right? Okay. And if you abuse the snot, they're roto-molded. Like, they're basically made like kayaks are, what you know, like, in, like roto-molded wow. kayaks. They're pretty bomb-proof. Jeez. Um, I also heard a lot more people talking about the wire cutters pick for the best hard cooler. That's Coleman's 70-quart extreme cooler. 50 bucks delivered to my door sounded a lot better than $400, although indestructible sounds pretty good. Um, the drain port's really, really good, which is makes it so much easier to clean. Uh, and uh, I hate lifting a wet cooler over my head to drain it. I yeah. don't know if you've ever like gotten pissed while you're cleaning <laughs> the cooler, and then you end up, and then you, the water comes down, and you become even more agitated. Yeah, I've never done the ice challenge myself, but uh, I've definitely had other people do it, like this, my husband. This wasn't an ice challenge. This was just like, I can't get the water out of the cooler. <laughs> um, and I love insulation on this. This thing way outlasts our old cooler. Um, you know, a 70 quart cooler, that's like 112 ounce cans plus the ice to keep them drinkable. Um, in theory, that's enough uh, food for two folks for a week or me and my two little Hoover children uh, for a weekend. And if, uh, <laughs> if you pack with small creatures, they eat everything. I love my children. Uh, they have 100 quart versions of this along with a 52 quart version. And I think I see a drinks food cooler split in our future. Um, but these are really, really nice. If you haven't been up there, uh, Walmart's probably got the best deal on them. Um, you can get them directly from Coleman. You can find them other places. It's a nice cooler. The handles are overbuilt. They have steel hinges that are replaceable, which I'm a big fan of because there's no wheels. You can sit on them without trashing the wheels or the insulation. That's cool. If you're really, really hardcore, you can fill in the little drink cups with insulation and get another 15 minutes of ice <laughs> out of there. Um, but they're, these are amazing. These are like five or six days of ice retention, which wow. I think is pretty amazing. That's awesome. That's overkill for an afternoon barbecue, but why not have a cooler that doesn't suck when the power goes out or you do go on a serious camping trip and here in earthquake land, we think about the power going out That's a lot. That's what we do. Also zombies. zombies. I think this would be great for the zombie apocalypse. For packing the zombies or packing the frozen goods as you were escaping the zombies? Packing the frozen goods <laughs> while I'm escaping the zombies. Of course, that way we can just stay on the road for a very long time without having to stop and find ice somewhere. Is that last frozen Costco lasagna for 27? I need 27? to bring my ice cream. <laughs> I need my ice cream. <laughs> when the ice cream runs out, a whole lot of zombies gonna die. Yep. <laughs> Let us know what you think or yeah. your favorite pick. Uh, don't recommend that one that we saw at CES a long time ago that had a speaker built into it. The cooler with the speaker, just, no. That's one of those things that started out as somebody's like college drunken project. Yes, definitely. And then turned into a, <laughs> I don't know, there's there's something charming about having the, the car stereo in the cooler. It just makes it really bad as a cooler. Let us know what you think. <laughs> Ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at techthing. Last week's talk about TV antennas led to a bunch of questions about ATSC 3.0, or as we like to know it, broadcast TV over IP. Uh, You won't need a new antenna, which is great, but you will probably need a new TV or an external tuner that supports ATSC 3.0. And that basically means it's the Advanced Television Systems Committee 3.0. It's the digital broadcast standard used by North America, parts of Central America, and stream. (laughs) 
strangely enough, South Korea as well. It's a thing. Yeah, so it will replace your current HDTV tuner's ATSC 1.0 standard that dates back to 1996. I was 11 years old. Just Let's to give you an idea that. of that. Yeah. And it will merge OTA broadcasting and the internet as well. So this is supposed yeah. to be really, really cool. So for perspective here really quickly, so like the standard is kind of finalized in 1996 yeah. and we all started seeing it around 2004 or 5-ish, right? Right, right. Uh, Give or take. Don't expect 3.0 tuners to show up in TVs until 2019. The chipsets were literally just completed uh, and there was literally one ATS 3.0 demo at CES that uh, Robert and I could find. I'm guesstimating 2020 is going to be the big year for ATSC 3.0. Okay. So this is a classic. A little bit more time. Yeah, I mean, this is a classic chicken egg tech rollout. Broadcasters aren't going to want to spend tons of money to upgrade until there's a critical mass of televisions. And quite frankly, I don't think ATSC 3.0 tuners are going to make somebody that just spent 700 bucks, much less $7,000 on a new 4K UHD HDR television buy a new TV. So yeah, it's going to take a while to roll out. Um, you know, if you dig around, I think a couple, three weeks ago, Univision ah, switched on the first ATSC 3.0 station in the Phoenix test market. Wow. And before you ask, there's going to be a transitional period where current ATSC and 3.0 will both be available. Eventually, like analog, I'm pretty sure they're going to turn off uh, ATSC 1.0. So why should we care about this? Well, over the air television is still the most popular method of watching live events. You know, sports ball. Ah, uh, yes, our sports ball. Um, <laughs> no? No? Curling? Okay. Uh, <laughs> not enough curling in American television. Although, <laughs> after this Olympics, that could change. Um, okay, so ATS 3.0, um, you know, like this whole kind of IP thing, it promises better reception, mm -hmm. especially in difficult areas like cities. Uh, it's going to be a proper 4K UHD over-the-air spec with supports for HDR and high Yay. frame rates. Um, something that I'm especially in love with, no more scanning for channels. And if you've ever had, like, you know, like, you know, for some reason, maybe somebody managed to reset your television right before the big sports ball game or the yeah. Olympic event goes on, and you're like, click, and it starts scanning for channels, and you're pounding your head against the yep. coffee table. <laughs> um, you could have access to more channels in your area. Uh, Dolby AC4, that supports 7.1.4 channel audio, along with Atmos and DTS-X, uh, is a big step up from the current spec of AC3, which says 5.1 audio. <laughs> Um, you'll be able to watch over-the-air broadcasts on mobile gear like smartphones or tablets or in your car or RV, again, without scanning for channels. In-home gateways will allow you to use your existing tablets and phone to watch over-the-air broadcasts. Um, my understanding is you need basically one ATSC 3.0 tuner in your house to feed all of your existing televisions, okay. which is nice. It won't be like, you're going to have to buy a new television to get this. Yeah. You're going to have to buy a box, which sounds so much like the whole analog to digital it transition. It sounds like hopefully it would be cheaper. Hopefully. <laughs> it should be a lot cheaper. Um, something I think is actually really cool, the emergency alert system uh, gives the possibility of localized amber alerts. Uh, localized severe weather warnings, your TV could possibly even start up to start shouting about that there's a hurricane or a tornado coming or that somebody's missing. That's kind of scary. Although I believe yeah. Japan currently has something like that implemented right yeah. now. I mean, on one hand, you know, when you're sitting in, you know, Northern California and you get an amber alert for somebody in San Diego. Yeah. You know, there's not much you can do. Yeah, but if all of a sudden you're getting an amber alert about somebody that's in your county, or you're getting told that a hurricane is about to stomp uh, your right. neighborhood flat, that's a big plus. Mm -hmm. um, I really think though this is about giving broadcast stations tools that cable is used forever, uh, video on demand, uh, the idea of maybe selling seasons so you can binge watch on shows. There's also noise about things like you know pay this much money and get alternate camera views during a, you know, a baseball or a football game. The possibility of over-the-air skinny bundles that work like the cable alternatives you can buy online for 40 bucks or 25 bucks a month. Um, we'll see. It's one of those things where it's like, there's lots of things you can do with this. Yeah. Let's see if anyone adopts it. I mean, everyone, <laughs> like eventually I think all the broadcasters will slowly adopt this. Um, and because they get some pretty cool benefits. Uh, instant viewage stats for TV stations, hyper-targeted local advertising. Uh, it's finally going to automate and upgrade the ad buying process for local TV stations, which they're desperate for. Uh, and possibly uh, bi-directional stuff, like buying directly through the show you're watching, mm. because QVC isn't addictive <laughs> enough. <laughs> QVC. <laughs> or the Home Shopping Network, whichever one's still on. I try to avoid those channels, because really, who doesn't want to invest in their future by buying a set of 27 Hummel figurine-like objects? What? <laughs> <laughs> I do this already. Well, but you don't, you know, but do you like, do you like turn on the, the, the shopping no. channel? Yeah. 
There yeah. is no Sailor Moon shopping channel yet. 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 If yet. there was, I would totally watch it all the time. Oh my goodness. So this is really great if you yeah. enjoy and watch and currently subscribe to live television. But if you are a cable cutter like I am, this mm -hmm. isn't really going to affect you. Well, no, this is perfect for cable cutters, right? Because it's sort of a next generation standard for the over air broadcast. If you use over the air broadcast. Over the air. I mean, cause yeah. one thing is like, if you have particular shows that are, are broadcast on ABC or CBS or PBS, um, or you want to watch the Olympics, over the air is one of your only options for right. that. Um, this isn't going to impact your antenna choice though. Uh, and it is a long way away for most of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more news as the stations roll out and we can actually buy products that support ATS-3 because uh, none of them really exist. Um, related note on behalf of Robert Heron, since every time we talk about over the air, he talks about Major League Baseball. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, MLB TV, um, their sort of online uh, system for watching uh, baseball is pretty amazing. Cool. Um, and that's also the foundation of, of Disney's subscription channels that are coming up. Very cool. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you have a do you have an over the air tuner set up? I don't up because I I really don't care to watch the mm -hmm. Olympics or live sports or right. any of the award shows. So for me, it doesn't affect me right. at all. So there's no real point for yeah. me to upgrade to one of the ATSC 3.0 TVs once they do come out because it's not something that I watch currently. I'm like a very strict cable cutter in, <laughs> in the in the. Uh, Amount that like I don't even watch any OTA TV. I hadn't thought about over the air for a long time, except in the fact that it looks so good is yeah. sort of a demo uh, it does until look the good. Olympics, and and then I was just like, wow, mm -hmm. look at all these channels. Yeah, seriously, that I don't watch <laughs> because I can get them instantly on my uh, Roku box. <laughs> Well, to wrap it up, a bunch of our friends were over at this bike party ride over the weekend, and during a break, one of them caught their foot on a cable, and they tumbled, and they fractured their tibia, which is super scary and super painful, and I, like, almost had a heart attack. I mean, it sucks, but not nearly as scary and painful as, like, a head injury. So luckily, you know, he had a helmet on, and he didn't have a heart attack or a deep wound that can lead to a person bleeding out in minutes. So right. luckily those did, those things didn't happen, but he did fracture his tibia. And, oh. Our friend who remains nameless in respect to his privacy uh, is out of the hospital and out of surgery, Yay. and we are thankful. <laughs> um, but all of this had us thinking. Um, mm -hmm. It can be a really long time between dialing 911 and somebody showing up to take care of the situation. Yeah. So this week, uh, do something analog and get up to date on your first aid skills. And uh, one of the things for me as I started getting updated on my first aid skills a couple years ago was discovering how much everything had changed. If you don't have current CPR and first aid certifications, it's time. Find your local chapter of the Red Cross and get certified. Um, Absolutely. They do CPR, they do first aid. Then start looking at advanced classes. Uh, I learned a ton when I did a pre-hospital trauma class, uh, including uh, everything I learned about tourniquets when I was a Boy Scout yeah. is no longer valid. But that's <laughs> really? a whole other conversation. Wow. Uh, yeah, the, the whole... <sighs> so I guess it's good to go back even if you were in like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts yeah, as I mean, a kid. Yeah, because <laughs> that, I mean, especially in terms of a lot of the trauma stuff, you know, we have 17 years of our service people being in constant wars. And one of the things we've learned is a whole lot about how to deal with horrible injuries and keeping people alive. So everything yeah. I was taught when I was like 13, almost all of it is incredibly invalid now. Um, my wife did a wilderness uh, medical certification. Um, you know, it's uh, especially CPR, tourniquets, um, you know, the order in which you, you deal with someone's injury. Yeah. Uh, it literally, like everything has changed since I was a kid. If you haven't taken first aid or CPR, in a long time, learn a new skill, save the life of somebody you love, be prepared. Yes. And to our friend, get well soon. Get well soon, we love you. We are so stoked you are out of the hospital. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my goodness. On that cheerful note, I'm Patty Norton. <laughs> I'm Shannon Morris. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Literally, like a lot of the fundamentals have changed. That's crazy. You know, one of the ones that was a big one for me would be like, because we used to, when I was. I guess it makes sense. Lots of science changes. Well, it's also like, you know, it turns out Experiences like. Experiences. Yeah. And, and, and also, I mean, you know, it, 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 you can not breathe for two, three minutes if all your blood can run out in seconds. So, like, what was the biggest thing for me was like getting in the mindset is like, you stop the leaks first. 
and then you like worry about whether or not they can actually breathe, which is terrifying. Um, <laughs> You know, tourniquets, like, they used to be very judicious about tourniquets. Now they're just like, you know, if they're bleeding heavily, put a tourniquet on it. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. In ways that just would not. It's, it's all changed, Shannon. I know. Like technology. <laughs> Medical technology.